Good morning. How are you doing today, Benjamin? I'm doing great. How are you? Fantastic. What is it like to put a book like this together? Because there are so many different authors that have different levels of play and stuff, but you really go into this in, in a way that it's like, oh my God, it, it's being played out like it's happening right now. Yeah, it's it's a challenge. Uh, I mean, a, a lot of the book is based, uh, sort of the core of the book is based on these sort of archive files uh, um, from the old uh, communist spy agency in Czechoslovakia. So sifting through all that stuff was what took an incredibly long amount of time. And then you sort of have to then, even once you do that, you kind of jump to the next step of trying to put that in a, in a way where it's a story that people can read rather than just sort of listing right you know, quotes from documents so it was uh it was uh, it was labor intensive i'll say yeah because there is flow in there and i've always wondered because otherwise it just basically becomes a book of reference instead of you know the actual storyline itself yeah that's a real challenge i mean even when you go through the first draft and, and my editor uh kind of goes through it clive frittle uh my editor went through it and that was you know something that we went through the first time and there were sections that do kind of end up like that you know you you want to convey you, you kind of think you have all this inf in interesting information which you do but the challenge becomes you know not making it read like a list of just sort of right. presenting research on a you know on a page and making it into a compelling story that people want to read which is obviously you know what i want to do too yeah because it, it really does it, it, it's got that edge to it where you go okay I, I i know i need to get some sleep but no i want to go one more chapter give me one more chapter <laughs> well I, I i appreciate that i mean that is yeah that's sort of you know you kind of um when you're structuring it you kind of want to you know end each chapter on sort of uh, a, a, you know something like a cliffhanger and i guess you know i definitely i'm you know somebody that you know i'm 42 I grew up in the, the sort of the TV generation and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, and especially now when you kind of see these, these, you know, high quality, you know, sort of multi-episode, you know, show a uh, mad men or something like that. You kind of get that same feeling when you're streaming, you know, you're kind of like, Oh, it's how late is it? Oh, I can squeeze in one more. And so I guess, you know, some, <laughs> in some way that seeps into your head, you know, and, and I, maybe it's a generational thing, I guess all authors and writers have always kind of, you know, they kind of want to pull you forward, but, but it sort of naturally is some, a way that I kind of kind of thought about it once I got into it, you know, almost as ep each chapter is an episode that could kind of stand on its own. But also you want to kind of pull the reader, pull the reader ahead uh, as fast as you can. Where were you? Where were you at when when the liar basically hit your heart and it said, look, uh, this is this is your next project, Benjamin? Yeah, I was a journalist in Prague. Uh, yeah. And so I kind of uh, it was more sort of this this urban myth that I kind of heard about, about the coachers who are, you know, the main characters, especially Carl Coacher. And I'd been living there for a couple of years. And sort of, I was able to sort of poke around and, and, and get an email address for him and kind of reach out to him. And then, uh, you know, I started meeting with him and then kind of, as you start to wade into it, it's hard to stop. You know, it, it's sort of like, uh, um, the story just gets multi-layered and deeper. And then I had the archive files and it's sort of just, built momentum on its own. So I'd say pretty early on, I, you know, I had been a journalist long enough to sort of recognize a good story. And then it was sort of like, okay, can I do this justice? How would I execute this? And so, you know, pretty early on, I was, I was all in and, and it, it, it was a lot of, a, you know, the challenge was doing it justice really and, and trying to structure it in a way, um, you know, that was compelling and, and also accurate, you know, and, and a lot of stuff around the Cold War um, you know, as I was doing sort of my own research of secondary sources and other books and, and, and things like that comes, comes with sort of a, um, you know, a political, a political slant. And, and, and I really was focused on, all right, I want to tell a story about people, yeah. you know, it's obviously in this, this setting of history and, and, and politics and global sort of global events. But the stories that I'm interested in are about, you know, real people. And, you know, most books that I read about this era, at least to me, didn't have that sort of, you know, nuance and detail of, of sort of, you know, putting you, you in somebody, a real person's shoes. And so that was really where I tried to drill down. And um, yeah, that, that, that's kind of where I started. Well, you're bringing reality back to back to where we are right now, because, I mean, there's a lot of people that, you know, you, you mentioned Cold War. They go, the what? Yeah, the Cold War. What do you mean? And, and so it's books like The Liar that say this really did take place and this really did take place with, with the CIA, the KGB. This isn't a movie here. Yeah, I think that's, you know, uh, you know, in terms of presentation, I'm trying to, to, to write things out in a way that would be like a spy thriller type of novel nice. as a presentation. But, 
you know, the content is nonfiction. It's true. Uh, the things I'm quoting are from historical documents. The people that are talking said those words. And so, yeah, I think that is, you know, and, and I guess the, the thing that really, if, um, you know, maybe to expand even further on your previous question, that really, um, you know, drew me in further and further was how detailed some of this stuff I was able to come across really? was. And so you're saying, you know, this really happened. It's like, I can, I can, I, I found documents where I'm in a restaurant and I, you know, at this address and I know what people are wearing, you know what I mean? Like what color tie that somebody has on and because of the, the details of the documents. And so that sort of stuff and being able to, to talk about that sort of stuff in a real way, you know, it, it, it almost brings texture to this thing that, as you say, it's kind of mythical, right? You sort of say cold war. It's like this big, you know, capital C, capital W <laughs> and people, you know, it, it feels like a movie, but it's like, no, here's a guy wearing a polyester tie at this cafe at the Columbus in Columbus circle in New York city. And this is what they said. And it, it's really what they said. How did you get into those archives? And the reason why I bring it up like that, because I mean, we're, we're living in an age right now with the thing that happened at Mari Largo and stuff like that, where it's like, wow, I mean, here's all these archives of history that, you know, I mean, it's like, how did you get in there when, the, when, when our own history uh, people are, are saying, no, don't, don't let anybody in, in on this stuff. Yeah. So I think a lot of the countries that were, you know, a lot of the Central and Eastern European countries, um, you know, after the fall of communism kind of had this, you know, something like a, like a truth and reconciliation process where they opened up uh, a lot of these documents and made them public. I mean, it's really famous. East Germany was, the, I think, sort of the most famous one. But Czechoslovakia, and now the Czech Republic and Slovakia, did the same. So you could actually go in, if you were a citizen of these places, and see if someone had been spying on you. And this also had the, you know, the effect of if you were spying on your neighbors, they found out about it at that point. Yeah. And so a lot of this stuff was just made public, but it is an incredible, incredible amount of material. So I was dealing with a very few, you know, I had specifically people I was trying to find their files, but it was mm -hmm. 30, I think I went through 30,000 pages. Cool. I mean, it's insane. <laughs> and so they have these sort of, you know, public, you know, something like the National Archives that, that in the States, but sort of this public institution that houses these things. And there's kind of researchers and scholars sort of, you know, producing reports on the most important elements or whatever. But basically, if you have some idea of what you're looking for or, or, or a specific person that you're looking for, a lot of this historical stuff is actually public record. Now, there's a few things that get redacted, um, you know, uh, be, uh, and actually uh, some of the things that were redacted from uh, Carl's file were redacted at the request of the U.S. government, ironically, mm. because he was sort of in this middle ground of also working for the CIA. So. Um, yeah, but I guess in that sense, they kind of had this sort of, they just opened, opened the doors and let everyone in. That was sort of the, 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 you know, which caused a big mess, but also they viewed that, you know, post 1989 and in the 1990s, that this was the, the fastest and bestest, best, bestest, best way to, <laughs> to, to, to sort of, you know, overcome this sort of, you know, the ghosts of the past, if you will. There had to be trust on both sides. You had to trust Kocher and he had to trust you. How long did it take for that trust to, to you know, to come into development? Hard to say. Uh, so that you're right. Uh, I think uh, in one sense, um, I was fortunate in that he's a pretty confident guy mm -hmm. and he kind of has this belief that he's going to be able to sort of spin you spin me in this case, right? So he was pretty quickly willing to talk. Um, and you, you, you know, and then I think, you know, as we got to know each other, he kind of, um, you know, respected me at least that I was asking good questions and I kind of, you know, I had a good memory of what we talked about last time, this sort of stuff. And so it's sort of a slow process. Yeah, you're right. You kind of build just by meeting each other. Now at the same time, you kind of got to be, you know, I'm, I, I, you have to maintain skepticism. Mm -hmm. um, you mm -hmm. know, this is a guy who's got a history of, of doing, uh, of not, the book is called The Liar, of not telling the truth, right? And, um, you know, so always, um, you know, listening, trying to put yourself in, in his position, but also sort of not, you know, not falling for everything hook, line, and sinker, if you will. And, and I would also just add, I talked to a lot of other people for the book, and, and, you know, ex spies, ex FBI people that were interested in, in invest, you know, in arresting spies. Not, it wasn't just Carl that you had to be skeptical of, um, you know, 
giving it to you straight or, or telling you the truth, right? People tend to, a lot of these people were older. They tend to remember things differently 30 or 40 years later. They tend to, you know, play up their yeah. own role in events a little bit. So it, it was really an exercise and always sort of triangulating, you know, between what someone was telling you, maybe what you had in a document, maybe what somebody else had and trying to, to you know, make sense of that in, you know, make sense of what you know, what they're telling you with what you know uh, to, to absolutely be true and trying to, you know, put the pieces together a bit like a puzzle. Yeah. You bring up a really good point about how they've changed sto stories and things like that, because I truly believe that if you live in your past, you're going to rewrite the past so that you can become comfortable with the past. What, did you have one of those moments where they would say something and you go, I don't know, man, I got some documentation right here that says you did other things. Yeah, there's there's a lot of that, I would say. And I mm. guess that maybe the harder the harder part is to judge whether the person is trying to mislead you on purpose uh -oh. or whether it's yep. simply, you know, an, an, you know, a 75 year old person who's t remembering something that they did when they were 45 and remembers it with some rose tinted glasses. I mean, I guess I, a little bit, I use this example of, you know, what if I, what if I'm telling some story about my old high school football career or something like that? You know, it, I may not be lying, but uh, I bet I was a my story. I'm a little bit faster than I was, <laughs> you know, <laughs> So that sort of thing, you know, it's, it's that sort of, it's, it's that sort of mix and that's, you know, and, and both things happen. You kind of have people say, say things that you're like, I, I know that not to be true. And then you kind of have, you know, situations where people sort of, you know, it, it seems a little tilted a little bit one direction or another. And so, um, yeah, that's the challenge. Obviously that's the challenge and, and, and trying to be as close to the truth as you can in a nonfiction book. I mean, there are plenty of times where it'd be a hell of a lot easier just to to make up some 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 bit of the narrative that, that that puts it all together in a simple way. Unfortunately, you can't you can't do that. Unfortunately, so Hollywood always likes to make the double agent. You know, it, it, they almost try to make it like a sexy story and stuff like that. But what I love about your story is that the fact that I I, I sat there and I said this is real. But what happens is I've got to be able to learn from this as well because I'll bet you there are people that are that are sitting there with yellow highlighters going really I'm gonna I'm gonna not I'm gonna put, mark this out I'm gonna put this in here I'm gonna do this I'm gonna learn from this. Yeah, I think that you know I think you know, the story's the story and uh, on its own, you know, on that top level, it's sort of hopefully a compelling sort of exciting read. Um, you know, when you're, you're putting a book together though, when someone gives you the opportunity to put a book together, you kind of, you kind of think about what your book, you know, what you want your book to be. So sort of on a, a secondary level, it was important to me to have this sort of, you know, historical context. Um, and in particular for me, I had spent a lot of time living in Prague and, and, and I had, you know, just sort of through being there and I worked as a journalist there for years, you know, I'm American, but I learned a lot about the Cold War and the history of sort of the countries, not the Soviet Union, not Russia, mm -hmm. right? Czechoslovakia or Poland or things like that. And there's a lot of nuance and detail that we tend to gloss over. And so putting sort of little pieces, little tidbits like that in there, where relevant, you know, where, where they kind of aid the story or or provide context was something that was really important to me. And, and you know, I kind of felt my wife is, for example, uh, was born in communist Czechoslovakia, she's Slovak. Um, so you kind of have this, I don't wanna say I had a foot in both worlds, but a little bit do, you know, you kind of have this, this, it's not loyalty, but, but yeah, loyalty to sort of um, presenting, um, you know, the reality of, of, of another country or other people's experience correctly or in detail and, and and to me as a person who reads books and 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 you know used to read spy stories or history books or stuff like that um you know that's not what i get from every book that i read you know and so i you know i you know was really conscious about trying to do that plus you know my wife would uh I, I'd, I'd be sleeping on the couch <laughs> or something like that if, if i did <laughs> so when you take on a story like this where, where you're actually doing the history of, of a of a double agent did somebody follow you? Did you ever have that feeling that, you know, because it's like, here comes this guy. He's looking for information. He's talking to these other spies. What's this guy up to? I think, uh, no, not quite to that extreme, you know, uh, because a lot of the people on this, most of this stuff happened a while ago, mm -hmm. you know. And so, um, but um, on a less sort of less 
intimidating level. You know, somebody kind of gets wind, some, some ex CIA person who was involved in, uh, you know, peripherally involved in this, or, um, you know, I had a, I won't say his name, but I had a gentleman, um, just a few weeks ago, um, he was the son of a, a CIA, um, a CIA agent who had died under basically mysterious circumstances in the eighties. And, you know, he was trying to piece together his father's own sort of story. Cause there were some holes in it. And, 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 and Carl and his father had, wasn't for sure, but had some somehow, you know, um, perhaps crossed paths. So you do kind of have these people that come and that this was a, not a threatening conversation at all. This was a guy who was just genuinely curious to see, you know, to, to learn, to learn what he could. So you kind of have these people that sort of, you know, get wind of it and, and come out, um, you know, come, I don't want to say come out of the woodwork, but come, come out of somewhere and, mm-hmm. and contact you. Um, and so that's, you know, and that for the most part, that's good. You know, I, I guess I've had a couple conversations where, where I talk to people and, and sort of my, um, these are Americans, I would say, um, my, you know, this story, the archives that I went through were not available to the FBI or the CIA in, in the 80s when Carl was eventually arrested. So in some ways, I know stuff that they didn't, okay. a lot of stuff that they didn't. And so in the course of interviews, you encounter these people and, and they're sort of telling you you're wrong when, when you, you know you're not, you know. So there's not, you know, there's not any terms of like physical threats or intimidation in terms of like someone following me as I walk down the street and, and me being paranoid about that, but more, um, you know, you have these encounters where, where people are, are, are sort of both good and bad trying to find out how much you know, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Did you record any of this, get it on film, or did you get it on, because, I mean, th- th- what's, this book has got to go beyond just being, you know, um, a, a group of pages and things like that. I mean, there's got to be a documentary somewhere in this, or either that or someone's going to pick it up and make it into a movie. I mean, I, th- I think it's it's well suited for that. Certainly, I, I think uh, I have I have audio recordings of all my interviews with Carl uh, and some other ones. I don't have I don't have uh, video recordings. Um, so I think it does it does certainly you know certainly it's my hope that there's 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 this thing has more legs and that and and I think the you know I I said this when I was sort of presenting you know when you're pr- trying to convince a publisher to let you write a book, um, you know you have to explain to them why you know, why they should let you write this book and why you're the person, you know, Mm -hmm. kind of to write this book. And for me, I always felt, you know, I I actually find some of the book, you know, when I'm learning about sort of some big event or big historical events, I often find a story that's about maybe a minor, more minor character to to be more illuminating. So when I'm going through talking to a publisher and I'm saying, is Carl the most important spy in the history of the Cold War? He's not, right? But his story and some of the stuff that happens might tell you as much about the Cold War as anyone else, yeah. right? That's kind of my, the real, it's a real person. We have details that, that, that other people don't have. And actually, what he's engaged in is more typical than, more, more typical of spying than sort of, you know, whatever, whoever your all-time hero spy is, right? Mm-hmm. That's sort of an, un, they're a hero because they're unusual. Mm-hmm. And so in, in, in a day-to-day basis, these sort of things are, um, um, this, is a, this is a more accurate or, or more, more precise uh, story about those times. And so, yeah, my hope is that that, that, that translates, translates a number of ways. When the, when the base of the narrative and the story is good enough, and then there's enough color and detail and things like that, um, and the characters are real, and, and, and you know, hopefully you feel like you can t- touch them, or if you read the whole book, you kind of get some insight into them as people. Um, you know, I, I'm hopeful that, that, that there's other ways that this sort of, you know, story can, can, can reach more people. Man. Benjamin, you got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always, always going to be open for you. I appreciate it, Earl. Thanks. Thanks a lot for having me. I really enjoyed the talk and, uh, hope to catch you some other time. Absolutely. Will you be brilliant today? Okay, sir. All right. You have a good day too. Bye-bye.